I think that a lot of people move on from the fundamentals too soon. If you had a really, really basic force, what is really, really neat, would that be a better looking army overall? I am terrified to paint them and ruin them. They'd like all of us at all our different stages of our painting journey have that feeling. If you're taking your time and you're being neat and you're being careful, there's no mistake you can't overcome with it. Joe, I hear that you're a little bit miffed at uh, the drill off last week. I am fuming, <laughs> to put it to put it lightly. No, it's not that bad. Basically, me, I had a, once I saw the edit. We had a, for anyone who didn't watch last week's, we had a drill off between. George and James, it was like an ongoing argument, wasn't it? What's the best method to drill barrels? Which is now firmly settled. Well, you say that, there's still contention. Nah, there's sorry. still contention, apparently. No. Um, the So James was using his big power tool drill. Um, Obviously, like anyone. George was using a pin vice and making loads of excuses along the way. <laughs> Sounds um, about right. I wasn't personal. I was then, I was the judge. Arbitrator. Okay. Yeah, trade, yeah, yeah. So this, so this is, this is um, my, you know, it's it's my call, and it's my uh, integrity on the line as to how people feel about, you know, the the judging of the the judgment that I've made. Yeah. Um. So when I saw the edit, I was just a little bit confused as to the pictures that were used of the of the barrels because I thought that the pictures should show a front on like looking down the barrel uh-huh. and then like maybe a side one to show the muzzle the thing, brake, the muzzle brake, because also that number one, that's like obviously the main way that I was looking at them when I was, when I was doing it. Can I just, before you care and just, just say I had nothing to do with the photos. No, no, James so didn't have anything to do with the photos. Wanna, this is all George's just wanna, fault. Just <laughs> Let's um, get that straight out there. Yeah. Look, I like that Joe was, was speaking elusively about it and then James is just ready to throw me under the bus. Well, look, let's, let's, call, let's call a spade a spade. All, all, right? okay. all it was, so, was, was, number one, I think instantly I realised that we should have taken pictures and I should have judged off of the pictures. Mm -hmm. Because number one, looking at it, even with my glasses on. You didn't realise that James's looked terrible. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Because I, I, I don't find I won, George. I don't actually necessarily think the voting would have changed, which is the saving grace of this. <laughs> which is the saving grace of this. But I rest there are certain dreamer. parts where I'm like talking about, oh, this one's cleaner than this one or something like that. And then in the picture, it just does not look like that at all. Or like, I'll be like, oh, this one's more central than this one. But then obviously, and then in the pictures, you can see that maybe that's not true. But, Looking at it, you know, as a person and having it in front of me, that's how it looked kind of thing. So I think what we should have done, number one, you know, shouldn't have thrown me under the bus and taken the dodgy pictures. But number two, <laughs> number two, in the, if we do it again, I think we take the pictures uh -huh. and then we judge based off the pictures. I'm torn here because I'd like to defend myself because I took the photos. But equally, if we'd done it, what you're saying now, I probably would have won. So... I don't know if you would have because I don't. Well, well, maybe. Well, who knows yeah. how it would have gone if we'd taken the pictures first? Because I still haven't actually seen any good pictures of the <laughs> of the drills. Because the one that was in the episode was this weird ninety degree angle that George insisted. We on discussed doing. this at length, so, and I'm not going to bring it up again on the show. But I get there was rationale for the way the photos were taken. It was not this like calculated decision where I'm trying to doctor the images. All I'm saying is, I'll leave it here. All I'm saying, if, if you know wait, what, wait, 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 wait. If you're if you're drilling, if you're in a barrel drilling competition, as we right, all are at some point during the day, <laughs> um, this is this is relatable content. Okay, if you're in a barrel drilling competition, and the judge is saying to you that your barrels are a little, your holes are a little bit off center, I think maybe one way to make them look better would be to take the pictures from an angle at a uh, at a forty five degree angle, maybe. I see so what, that you I see can't what you, I see really what see, I see what you're saying there, how Joe. off center yeah. some of the holes are. That's all. I, I'm not saying that you did that. I'm just saying I might have thought of doing that Look, if I was that. Way I inclined. was thinking, oh, we drew the muzzle brake and we drew the barrel. I don't want to take five thousand photos of every single one. So what I'll do is I'll take one nice shot where you can see the muzzle brake and you can see the barrel. Because funny enough, Joe, when I look at a Space Marine, I don't pick up the model and then stare down the barrel. No, no, it's no, not no. I understand that. I understand that, but. 
when I judge a barrel drilling competition, that is how I start <laughs> OG, the OG barrel drilling authenticator. Yeah. Has there ever been, am I the first ever barrel drilling competition judge? I think the so. The OBA, the OG the barrel OBA, drilling I think so. I think so. <laughs> So I feel like I have some say in the matter because I'm, this is my, do you know what I mean? I'm the, um, they were just pioneer by eye looking at front and side and the pictures did not display that. And I felt slightly, <laughs> I felt slightly like the pictures were, were making it seem like what I was saying wasn't true. However, there was one, also one thing that helped me is there's literally a clip where I go to George, would you agree and look at that? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> so, so that saved me a little bit. I think there's plenty to be learned. I do think on the face of it, I don't, I think the judging would have stayed the same personally. I agree. Specifically, actually, I was- <laughs> What do you mean you agree? <laughs> I, I, I agree. I concur. Do you concur? I concur. I concur. Yeah. Um, yeah, although there was one bit I was really confused at, so I'd like to ask you this. Yeah. Oh, this is after you left, I'm guessing. After I left, in between we judged and took the pictures, mm -hmm. did you change anything to the barrels? No. No. Okay. It's weird. Why? Because one of yours looked worse than I remembered <laughs> it looking. And we were like, I was like arguing about it, and then I looked at it, and I was like, well, See, I'd never taken a proper look at James's during the episode. Oh, and then after we when I went to take the photos, I thought, oh my God, Joe is mental. It was These like, look if, horrendous. Anyone, if anyone wants to go back and, and see what I'm talking about, I think it's the third one was like, the picture made it look particularly worse. Even when I saw it again after, I was like, I think what happened was the 45 degree angle picture thing really didn't help because you did the boring out, thing, yeah. which I actually liked the look of. But in the 45 degree angle, it did look weird, didn't that, it? That's why he done it. Because it's unpainted and that's the 45 it. degree angle. Make it, it, it look worse. looked weird. And I think that was a calculated decision. I know. Yeah, I've been ad. Oh, from, man. From, from, from the producer of the show. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yeah. So there's, I'm sure there's some comments about it that we'll get to after as mm -hmm. well. I just um, want to potentially touch on it. But yeah. I just want to thank everybody in the comments that had my back and that firmly believed in the power of electricity. I All just, four of them. <laughs> There were more. There was, there quite were, a few. There was, there was a lot, George. There was like, a fair there was few. Quite a yeah, few. Was a fair so yeah. I just want to say, you're all welcome. I, I think did, what I we're did gonna it do for the team. So. Next time, what we're going to do is all three of us are going to do it. I'm going to use a wow stick. Yeah. No, I, I, I've didn't you didn't you get didn't see my tweet the other day? No, I'm retiring. You're retiring from barrel drilling. Yeah, I'm the OG winner. That's it. Done. No, no, no. no. <laughs> He's one and zero career yeah, stats. Yeah, no, no, that's not how it works. The uh, so then, I, and I'm going to use a wow stick because every time we mention drilling everyone's barrels, going on everyone wow mentions stick. it. Everyone mentions the wow stick. So I'm going to use that, and then what we're going to do is take pictures of them. Yeah, we're going to get Adam to look at the pictures without knowing who did what set of barrels and what tool they used, mm -hmm. and then he's going to judge. No, yeah, that's yeah. Fair. based on the pictures, so he won't get sort of what's the word mugged off the way I did. <laughs> That's a very fair fair way of putting it, Joe. Yeah, okay. uh, I yeah. I think, annoyingly, I don't actually think that drill-off solved anything because I was let down by the pin vice because oh. I was I knew I'd, I knew from the hang on I knew from the start that I'd get smoked for speed, but I was thinking, don't worry, I'll make up for it in quality of drilling. But my pin vice was terrible, and James was making me. I was literally dying of laughter, and I couldn't hold it. The the thing where he starts. Drill him within 0.2 seconds because no, neither of us expected. Up. I know, but neither of us, obviously we both expected, first thing you pick up, knife, do the pilot holes, whatever. Oh. Like we both expected that. So to just hear, like within, it, was just, it was like three, two, one. Yeah, like, it was like the funniest thing. I think that it, that's got to be the funniest thing. I think your commentary really made us. that uh, I was that just experience. perplexed. It was hilarious. Like, I was just perplexed. I don't even remember what I said. I was just perplexed. Per 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 but your lips like confetti, Joe. Lips, no, <laughs> lips <laughs> like confetti. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm thinking, of, I'm reenacting it all now and I'm just getting just as frazzled as I was then. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we, we will do it again at some point. Yeah, because because you thought I'd made a mistake, and I was like, no, I just I was I like, oh, has he up. forgotten? In the I was like, in the excitement, has James forgotten that he needs to do his pilot holes first? I was like, in the excitement, has he just like got steam straight in? Um, nope. 
But you did flip flop though, because you did like one. You did start off drilling. You did, I, did, you I started did. off. Drilling. I literally wanted to just get used to because it, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, a brand new. But drill, the weird, the brand weird new drill bit. The weird part was you started drilling. I think you did one muzzle break. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Then, then you put it down. Then you went to the knife for all of them. Yeah, yeah. Then you went back to the muzzle. So that's what confused me a little yeah. bit. But like, you know, confusion could have been a tactic that worked here because I was I was mesmerized. <laughs> George was put off. Um, I think I think it was a a good you know a good tactic really it was purely um, just to try the new drill bit because George brought a new knife blade to the table I bought a brand new drill bit so yeah. I should have bought a brand new pin vise yeah <laughs> probably would have saved me yeah. yeah I don't think the scalpel blade was, did much for me in the end no not knocking Billy now are you I don't yeah I don't know well like in principle it did but it didn't it didn't help you know the drilling bit did it what do you mean in principle it did well, like, what did it do for you in principle well it's, it made like a nice starting oh, like, point for the barrel yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know it wasn't enough yeah, no, not at all. It was the work that came after. That <laughs> okay, we've got a little announcement. Seems like we've been doing these week after week, but we have another one. Uh, we are launching a brand new video series called Critique Clinic. And uh, I'll let James take the floor with a little explainer on that. Yeah, so uh, we get tons of messages on socials, on Patreon, on loads of places asking us for feedback of your miniatures. Um, and it's something I've always wanted to do, but never really had the best way of kind of like delivering it and giving it back. Um, so we've actually, yeah, this video series is going to be really good where George and myself are going to go down and just literally get a bit granular on the models and give you some real uh, factual and opinionated feedback so you can kind of like digest both of those versions of feedback and then really try and help you to, to progress your models. That's basically what we want to do with it. Yeah. So if you want to submit your models for Critique Clinic, uh, it's exclusive to our Patreon members. So that's patreon.com forward slash Siege Studios. And alongside it, it's going to be partnered with our Discord server. So on our Discord server, there is a new channel called Critique Clinic, and you can find details in there on how to submit your models. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles, and techniques from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios listeners comments time clegatron 786 says got to say i'm shocked and appalled that the dewalt sniper is using a bosch drill that's a fair point I'm what quite do you have to say for yourself i'm quite happy to that see the thing is it's like uh it's always good to choose the right weapon for the job and honestly a dewalt was just too much for you george so I, I, I busted out. I busted out the Bosch. It was out of kindness. Out of kindness, you know. That's fair. Didn't have the max charge either. The as well. The so, sniper is a humble man. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Yavin Prince says, just to clarify, waving a box cutter around and saying I've had Billy for a long time makes you look way more mental than using a Bosch drill for the barrels. <laughs> so, Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. The box uh, cutter was the biggest surprise, I think, of that whole experience. It was, we glossed over it, but it was absolutely insane. You've got this old blunt, bo blunt, blunt box cutter just waving it around. <laughs> Called all, Billy. All I'm gonna, all I'm gonna say is, the score reflected the performance of the tools and also the user. It, so see, this is the problem: is he's got you now. He's got you. It's frustrating when he's right, isn't it? Because, yeah. like you said last week, like the the, the logic is always the there. logic is always there. Yeah, but it's the the practicality that throws me off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John Jays says, I'm sorry, but no matter how much logic can be applied or how much efficiency shown, a fishbowl and a drill are clearly the tools of a madman. What's James's next tip? Apply paint with a super soaker? <laughs> well, I, I loved it. Well, I, I don't, I've got to think of a new hobby act now for the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on. Can no, you imagine like that's got exactly it though. I'm glad that some, because there's an alarming amount of people who just tune in who, who have the exact same wavelength of James when he says these things. It's they one make, of two ways. They make perfect sense. And they're yeah. like, yep, yeah, bang, bang, bang. Yep, yeah, I, I agree. So I feel like sometimes when I say this stuff and I voice my concern for mm -hmm. using a fishbowl as a uh, paint pot, uh, as a water pot, or 
using a drill to bar- uh, drill your barrels and stuff like that, that I'm potentially screaming into a void. And, and, <laughs> but so to get a comment, to get a comment like this is very it's reassuring. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, now me and you are sat here like absolutely perplexed, and then the comments they're lapping it up. Uh, but yeah, but yeah. hang on a sec, I've got a, I've noticed a few things here. Number one, the listeners' comments this week are very cultivated in a certain direction. No, 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 no. They're, they're yeah. a fair mix. Don't yeah. worry. And, <laughs> and 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 also as well. For anyone who's watching this episode and hasn't watched any previous episodes, it is not a fishbowl. It is a big right. candle. So I'm just going to throw that out there again. <laughs> like the number to him that makes it make more right. sense. Sorry. Sorry. I'll, whenever I refer to it now, I will say using a big candle as a water pot. Because it sounds, instead. when you say it like that, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. When you say it's just a giant candle, I think we're like, being, oh, I thought it was a fishbowl. I think we're being generous. We're making it sound better by calling it a fishbowl because at least water belongs in that. Yeah. But a candle. Yeah. That, does it, that makes the glass, way less sense. The glass candle. <laughs> I'm trying to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you it. noticed that with the comments in general, it's there's no nuance. It's one or two extremes. People either completely agree with us that it's insane or they're like, genius, genius James are on the same yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one yeah. or the other. Uh, Barnes Child says, Hey guys, love the show. Great advice and tips. But mostly, just because you guys are highly entertaining to listen to, top tier bomber mom banter. <laughs> I mean, that's a saying. That's got to be. That's got to be a T-shirt, surely. Bomb, uh, bomb, bomb, uh, He says, "Can't wait for the 2025 Drill Off Championships at Birmingham NEC." Uh, if I had to write a review for you guys, it would go: This podcast gives the same amount of joy and elation as finding a mini fridge I didn't think I needed under your painting desk with a pre-made TK Maxx wet palette chilling inside, <laughs> or like ordering 200 extra bases and finding that the rims have already been wet blended from a bad and black to steel legion drab to reduce office arguments, <laughs> or funnier than the squeaky noise of a crap pin vice, which I wish was a power tool. <laughs> My questions are, are your nose rings NMM or real metallics? <laughs> In the time it would take for James to finish his Mordian tanks, could Joe and George paint an actual full-scale World War II Sherman? <laughs> and by the fishbowl logic of more water equals cleaner brush, should I clean my brush in a local swimming pool, reservoir, or ocean? I mean, okay, first of all, it's a candle, not a fishbowl. No, <laughs> first of all, it is a glass candle bowl. So yeah. Oh, so we've got a candle bowl now. Well, it is. Yeah. It's the bowl that the candle goes yeah. in. Yeah, because candles at come in bowls. It, at least you're calling it a bowl. Yeah, well, it at is a bowl. At least you're calling it, it a bowl. bowl. It is yeah, a at least you're adding up to that. Yeah. I don't know. Can we paint a can we paint a World War Two German in the same amount of time? I, I reckon. Could. You know what, mate, I reckon I can paint my tanks quicker than you can. Paint I reckon a that I could paint a full size World War Two Sherman with a point two needle on an airbrush, base coating it from scratch quicker than he could paint one tank. Right. The thing is, we I'll tell you what, we, that's that's the next challenge for next week's episode. Is that in the budget? Yeah. Can we get a World War Two <laughs> Sherman? <laughs> I'll call Bovington up and I'll see if they've got one that needs a repaint. I like. I like. You know, we we hardly paint anything either, other than your work thing. We've gone over. I said that don't count. Yeah, we hardly that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we we hardly paint anything either, but we have successfully managed to tie it round to like, oh, James has never painted anything. The difference is, excuse getting, me. Getting, getting, here's the difference, Joe. <laughs> me and you aptly don't make promises we know we can't fulfill. True, we don't. Yeah, we don't promise stuff that we don't. Actually, I've done that a few times as well. But I just it's I've no somehow, crude shaper. Somehow, I've just managed to escape that I've just managed to push that onto James quite well that that stereotype but I'm the one that's at. consistently painting things at the moment so I'm that's bit, what I mean yeah and I've, we've bit, still managed we're still getting comments like that so I'm well, I'd, have, I'd have a rebuttal but apparently my work doesn't count so no, your work yeah. stuff doesn't count because we're talking about hobby stuff we're talking about hobby stuff like if I was doing it for work as well if we were all doing it for work like the door <laughs> do you know what I mean Oh dear. Been that, paid that's for that's it. That, it's a different, different. That's that. He's angling it around to communism thing. again. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So no, sorry, you can't just. Bring, I didn't bring up communism last time. That would be me. That was George. That would be me. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, brush tithe responded to our uh, the hit that we put out on James's old YouTube channel, and I'm pleased to say that uh, it looks like someone has earned themselves a T-shirt. They have because. <laughs> Within hours of that episode going up, quite impressively, uh, Brush Tide says, pretty sure I found James's channel. Spot on about it being more Essex. It's called Warlords Wargaming. That's it. I knew that I knew, I knew I'd heard the name before, yeah. but then he wouldn't tell us last week, would he? No. Yeah. Well, That's don't it, worry, because Brush Tide found it within about three and a half hours. Yeah, so. Warlords Wargaming. Yeah. I'd like to know how we found it. I that. reckon I've got, a, I've got a theory. So, so... Yes, it's Warlords Wargaming. That was the name of the St. Albans uh, Wargaming Club that I started when I lived in St. Albans for a period of time. Um, and uh, 
I think he found it because I said about stripping models. And I think that's one of, if not the highest viewed video on there. So he probably just searched for stripping models. Search for old man paints blood angels. I don't know. I like that's, definitely, that's definitely not the search terms, but yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I reckon there's some, I don't know the last time you searched that up, but I reckon there's some hefty stripping models videos out there now, like views wise. Yeah, I there's, there are. I reckon there's some big boys out there. Yeah. So I don't know if that's... Some big boys big I reckon that there's got to be, there's got to be, there's got to be like a... Didn't think that one through, Jack. A hundred, a hundred K, uh, big boy model stripping. Model. <laughs> Topic this week, miniature painting fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And do people accelerate perhaps a bit too quick in their excitement? So what brought this on was I was showing a model that I painted to my girlfriend the other day. And I find that always quite an interesting exercise because she's not into painting like, at all, like not her thing. So when you show her a model, she's not looking at it the same way that like a painter would, for example. And I'm thinking like, oh yeah, I've worked really hard on this. I've got mm -hmm. some like really cool like freehand script. And there's some like nice, you know, nice glazing on the panels and stuff like that. Was sure. it a full model? Oh yeah, it was full full character. You've done a full model? Yeah, we'll oh, get yeah. to that. Oh, okay. I showed her this model and I'm thinking like, oh, she's going to be like, oh yeah, I love the text, love the face, looks amazing. She goes, oh yeah, it's like really neat. You've painted the red, the red part neatly. And I'm like, right. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, like anything else? She's like, yeah, but like the trim, it doesn't even like bleed across the lines as if it was yeah. like a coloring book. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not sure that you're grasping what I'm trying to show you. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, George is still reeling from the defeat last week. He's like, what about the barrel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have a barrel. That's probably why. Yeah. Uh -huh. But anyway, in my head, that kind of sparked a thought of like, you, I remember when I first got into painting, getting really, really excited to learn like all the techniques. And there's like a billion videos on YouTube and you put them in your like, your little watch later playlist and you're like, oh, I want to learn NMM and I want to learn wet blending, everything. But you like, reality is you've still got like the model one in the sprue in the packet. Do you know what I mean? So I was thinking like, if I painted that model unneatly but had still done all of those things would the takeaway have been this model looks pants because yeah you have a, to someone else who's like not looking for all those little details would the overall picture be better so what i was thinking was for example if you're painting an army i've often spoke about how like you should focus on like doing lots of little extra embellishments and little details and things like that but i'm wondering if based on that conversation i'm second guessing myself now a bit and thinking if you had a really really basic force without loads of highlight stages and without all the trinkets painted and everything, but it was really, really neat. Would that be a better looking army overall? Food for thought. Yeah. It yeah, is, it's a good one. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I get what you mean as well, because I think it is interesting to see what people who aren't into miniature painting, what they pick up on when they look at a model. Um, I've spoken before about how we had a friend of ours, Joey, work in the office for a little while, uh, during COVID and just help with the packing and things like that. And he had no idea about Warhammer and he was looking at some of our, like, for example, silver level models and just assumed that that must have been the competition quality platinum that we were talking about because it was so neat. And to him, it just looked like, you know, incredible. It looked like something that he, he didn't understand how it was done. So that must be the, the high level thing. But in reality, as you say, the silver level, as we all know, is just a very tidy display quality model. If you compared it to a platinum model, you would see the difference mm -hmm. more so probably if you know what you're looking for and, yep. and, and uh, you're into miniature painting and stuff like that. So yeah, it's definitely something that I think would, uh, someone would experience at any level of miniature painting as well. If you're showing it to someone who doesn't know anything. It's just, it's weird the things that they pick up on that are different. If that yeah. Makes sense. It's, a to it's a totally different way of interpreting and visualizing something because you've not got that investment of understanding of what goes into it or how it should be done. Like if you, if you give a, a had a box art model to somebody and you showed them that, or if you had like a, a model that maybe was off of, off of eBay that maybe wasn't as painted as well or something like that. And you had those two models and showed them to two different people, their perceptions of on, on it would obviously be very insular to the, what they're reading on the model so for example one, one person looking to go oh, yeah that's painted really well and if you show them that box art model that's super refined they'd be like did, did someone paint this like it, you i think that's one of the things that with, when it comes to the thing that you said about like an army and whether it'd be it looked good if it was just painted neat but very minimally i think 
people will read it in different ways, but I think in general, people will look at it and go, well, that looks great or that looks really neat, like you said. It's almost like like Pearl was saying to you, well, at least it's painted, basically. That's almost like the, the, way, that you explained, <laughs> the way you explained it. Well like done. It, you tried. You <laughs> painted it at least. Yeah. Like, I, I, like, I, think, I think one of the things to, 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 to sort of like add to that specific thing that you're saying about, obviously, the fundamentals, I, I think that a lot of people move on from the fundamentals too soon. Because I think that if you master the fundamentals, the whole entire rest of it is not only quicker, but it's so much better. And you're, 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 the way that you create the transform the bare plastic into visually reading as leather, as cloth, as armor, as steel, as metallic. I think those fundamental things, they help you translate onto the model, the language of what those things should be a lot easier rather than rushing into them too quickly, which I find some people do do. The airbrush is a common yeah. It's probably the most obvious example of that. Like the amount of people that I know that have bought one and go straight onto a model and think that they need to go on a model straight away to get the experience of what it's like going on a model. When in reality, the fundamentals of just putting, putting water with a bit of ink or something in it, or even a very, very thin paint and just practicing the control on a bit of paper. If you practice that for a week, painting a model is so much easier and so much quicker and so much more refined yeah. by doing that. But the excitement factor of I've got this brand new shiny thing and I want to use it and get my models done really, the, the thought process, oh, this is going to make me really quick kind of takes over. If yeah. you follow me. Like, I think as well, like, I guess fundamentals, like in, in the world of information overload that we have, if, especially if you're a new painter and you're like going onto YouTube, for example, and because a lot of people are very, very good explaining advanced techniques in a very, very digestible and easy to understand format. I guess the fundamentals are different to different people depending on their style of painting. But I guess when I'm speaking about fundamentals, I'm talking more in like the the most basic sense of like thinning your paint, doing a base coat, maybe doing a wash or something like that. But I guess some people would argue that like, oh, wet blending is a fundamental technique. And then some people who don't really do wet blending would say, oh, well, that's an advanced technique for display painters and so on, if you get what I mean. <laughs> I don't think there's any like set list, is there? Of no. Like this is a basic, essential, fundamental technique, and this isn't. Other than if you really boiled it down, it's like what do you need to, need to be able to do at the bare minimum mm. to get a model paint? It's a like base coat in, yeah, washing probably, mm -hmm. or like neat recess shading, something like that. Or but even like, like pre pre base coat, like the thinning of your paint and like properly loading the brush and so on. Yeah. It doesn't even necessarily need to be actually physically painting a miniature. I mean, like the things I always bang on about brush control, pressure management, those two things, you can do that on a bit of paper, a bit of plastic card or whatever. And that's arguably, I I'd probably say that's one of the most important things as a painter to absolutely hone your craft on and master it. Because I always say it's like a paintbrush, unless you're finger painting the model or getting a potato out, like the paintbrush is literally the implement which which I don't know where that's come from. Well, Get a potato did, out. Did you not do potato painting when you were a kid? You cut shapes out I don't a bit. Think and then, so, no. How old are you? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> potato painting. Well, yeah. Back in my day before we had paintbrushes, we used to use potato. You, you two haven't lived. You haven't lived. Anyway, if you're watching this in the comments, please put whether you painted with potatoes as a kid. I thought wait, do you mean painting like on a potato no you cut the potato like when you used to like paint no, on an egg you or cut something the potato. how the hell do we get on this like you cut the potato and literally cut chunks out of it and make shapes and then you put it in paint oh, and you and use you, it as and like use a, a, use a stamp yeah i don't think so <laughs> I don't did you used to do this i don't i don't think i did, no. I did it finger painting I, i'm i'm with you i did finger painting as like a yeah well potato painting is like the next step on from finger painting oh well i was obviously stuck on the fundamentals of I, finger painting i didn't think that i went to a posh school but we did have paint brushes like even you know no, we but weren't finger painting was like that was before even school i would say that was at like play school i feel like finger painting and stuff like that yeah like because like, that's not just like I think that, oh, why are we getting so, on to this? Someone, <laughs> someone, someone surely in the comments is going to Sorry, you up. just threw me off with the term potato painting. That's all. <laughs> it's not my fault. Right, getting back to the point, what I was trying to say was that like those, those unless you're using other ways of getting paint onto the model. <laughs> Such as potatoes. <laughs> Such as potato. <laughs> oh, next to me, hack. Yeah, no. Um, but because the paint that brush. work for like a tank or something? It probably would, you know. Like, I mean, you could If you probably... wanted to get your like chapter symbol on a tank or your dreadnought, oh could God. you carve that into a potato and do the, do, do the potato stamp thing on it? 
potentially. Oh, well, maybe. Should we know. try it? No, let's, let's not. Next summer. challenge. Next <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I, I, I think because it is the thing that directly puts paint onto the miniature and, and you being the person that is in control of that, it's so, so important to absolutely master that 100%. Um, and I find that a lot of people that have come on classes and that like the brush control is is developed to a point whereby they're, they're competent painters and they can do stuff. But would you say that they could 100% be consistent with every brush stroke with the pressure management, the brush? Probably not. You know, and I think that's one of the things that does help you to become a much better painter and approach things with confidence of execution because you literally know that if you want to do this shape, this line, this tiny little motion or movement or whatever, you can do so with confidence and and not just once, but do it over and over and over and over again. And I think because of that, like the excitement of having the model finished and the excitement of getting the army done and the excitement of, of getting it on the table and gaming or have it in the cabinet or any of those kind of things does massively take away from doing the core thing, which is getting good at the, the stuff, which makes this part of it 10 times easier. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Well, I think you kind of have this false assumption when you're starting out, and I remember having this specifically, is if I don't learn those techniques, my model won't look good. And kind of this assuming that every good model has that stuff on it. Do you, like you, you Joe, started learning, you started picking up painting again around the same time as me, I think. Was it like 2018, yeah, somewhere around there? Yeah, 20, well, yeah. Yeah, 2017, I think. So yeah. very much in the like YouTube age mm -hmm. of tutorials and stuff. Do you remember like watching videos on YouTube, like how to do certain so the, techniques. Yeah, the first thing I watched was Duncan because I got the 7th edition box like I've spoken about before and they did a whole video series of Duncan on Warhammer YouTube channel painting the models from the box. So as someone who, although I was into it as a kid, I was never like fully in on painting as a kid. Um, I just assumed that's the official video that must be the best way to paint. So I'm going to watch that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm actually really glad that I did because although outside of base coating, I don't think I probably do anything that I learned in that video now. Yeah. Right. Um, cause it was very much, it, it was also before Warhammer started, um, separating into like, Here's an intermediate tutorial. Here's oh a, yeah, they do yeah. like the parade ready battle yeah, ready. Yeah, it was before situation. all that. Yeah. This was literally just like effectively the just the basic way to get your models painted so you can play with them. And it was very much like base coat it, wash it, layer up again. Um, they might have not even touched on edge highlights. I can't really remember. Yeah. Um, if they did, I didn't get that far. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I'm glad because it was like. <laughs> I know it turned into a meme, but like even like the two thin coats thing, like just not that you specifically need to use two coats on everything, but like just even knowing, okay, I need, I do need to thin my paint. I shouldn't take it straight out of the pot. Blah, 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 blah. I think that was really handy for me to learn going straight back into it. But I didn't really pick up on following actual YouTube tutorials from other YouTubers until I already knew a bit more about painting. Right. Because as someone we've spoke many times about kind of being into YouTube in, in all sorts of different subgenres, I'm very aware that the fact is that just anyone can upload anything and sound like they know what they're talking about. Yeah. So I was very We do it every single week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was very I was very skeptical over just randomly finding a painting tutorial with no um, context as who this person is. And as soon as they deviated from what I was seeing on Warhammer, I was like, okay, well, I don't know what one 
what one should I focus on here? Do you know what I mean? So I just decided to, I, I like to stick with the one thing, learn yeah. that. And I, I did with the Warhammer videos. And then when I knew a little bit more about painting, I was a little bit more comfortable of watching someone else's videos and going, oh, that's a good idea actually. Or, oh, I wouldn't do that because yeah. X, Y, Z, whatever. Uh, I also think around 2017, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it, airbrush videos were like, it seemed very heavily like most tutorials involved an airbrush to me. Like, I think, it, it, I think it probably still feels that way now, but because we have the, we I don't think, notice it so much. I actually think because of the introduction of like contrast and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's potentially less of it. A bit more it's now. filtered it out a little bit. Yeah. It's desaturated how many tutorials are actually just quite airbrushed. Well, definitely focused. in the speed painting uh, exactly. category, because if the you, airbrush if you, is less reliant. If you reliant. consider that most of the tutorials out there or most of the popular ones are probably around speed painting. Mm -hmm. Back then the only way to do a tutorial on that really was using an airbrush, I feel like. So I got quite put off because I didn't have an airbrush. I knew that the Warhammer ones didn't reference an airbrush. And I feel like a lot of the tutorials I clicked on almost instantly referenced an airbrush. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't yeah, want to, yeah. I don't want to worry about that yet. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have an airbrush until I worked here. So, so yeah, um, I think I'm glad that I, used an extremely beginner friendly tutorial to paint 10 or 20 models that I would look at now and think were God awful and I would never paint them again. <laughs> um, but I'm glad I did that because it, it, you know, it shows progress yeah. and it helps you learn the, the key things, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm the sort of person who, when I start learning something, I, I just go deep on like learning. Mm. And I remember just watching tons and tons of painting videos and not even like necessarily tutorials, just like, people showing off models that they'd finished or podcasts or just sort of being around it. And I guess from doing that a lot, you pick up a lot of like terms and stuff. And I would hear someone just like candidly, like throw the phrase like wet blending out. And I'd be like, what's that? Pause, watch 15 videos on what wet blending is. And I guess I kind of built up this like repertoire of like all these techniques that I'd like heard of and just assumed that every single model has all of them on it. Yeah. Which is, if you actually, I, I, even in a box ticking exercise, I think I'd actually very much struggle to paint one model using every single one of those. I think you would, yeah. Yeah. It's another challenge if I've ever heard <laughs> one. But I think that that was kind of distracting me from the, it, it's very hard now to navigate the space, I think, because there's no like, you can watch like a GW tutorial and I think there's like a ton of value in those. Um, especially for beginners, they're also they're also different yeah. to how they were, and and we spoke last week on how Games Workshop are approaching YouTube now yeah. and things like that, and they are specifically releasing here's a beginner tutorial, here's an intermediate tutorial, which I do really like. Um, yeah. I think their tutorials potentially have more value now than they did then because they're actually there's clearly like some care and thought, yeah, more care and thought, not there wasn't before, yeah, being put into them now. But I think like even outside of that, because there's so many different avenues to go down. Because even if you think like, depending on what, just let's just assume that you're doing Warhammer, right? And it's going to be in the 40K uh, system. Depending on what models you're picking, there's going to be a lot of different things that apply. Mm -hmm. So like on Marines, you might not really, you might do a lot of like dry brushing for cutting corners, but you wouldn't do that on something else that's got like a load of organic shapes because, you know, the harsh angles don't pick up. Or I'm going to do a ton of like wet blending on this, but you wouldn't do it on this because there's not loads of armor or something like that. So even like just trying to work out as a beginner, like what stuff you need to know and what's, that's why there can't really ever be a one video on how to start painting. And here's just an hour long video that you can watch that will explain everything. Like it's not really yeah. tailored enough. See what I did like, Tommy Saul did um, effectively a an all encompassing beginner's guide to miniature painting yeah. as part of his, uh, as his book. All right. And that's interesting. It, it's very good. I obviously that came out when I'm, I'm years into it now. Um, there's obviously still things covered in there that I don't really venture into too much in terms of like, there's stuff on NMM that I don't really do that much. Like, I've never really tried. And Tommy, Tommy is, is a fellow brush pressure management seventh dom if you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's like he he's there's loads of really informative pages in that book all about just physically how to manipulate and use the brush which when i i, I know tommy very well all cards on table and like i he, his book 
when I saw it a few times, I've seen it at different shows and I've spoke to him about it, et cetera, like that, that the pages in there that are specific about just the way to manipulate the brush and use the brush and fluctuate pressure on the brush head and different size brushes, et cetera. It, I haven't seen anyone else speak about brush usage in the same way as, as him. Like he, he literally has got some phenomenal information in that book. But it's, it's, to go back to talking about the fundamentals, it's that, what James just said, but it's also, here's how to remove a mold line. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's, uh, you know, I think there's about, it's either like a single like double page spread or maybe even two about just cleaning your models and things like that. Like yeah. it, it's, it's really informative and I've pointed a couple of people towards it. I don't know Tommy, by the way, and I just bought the book. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Not sponsored, by the yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I just... Um, yeah, I, I haven't met I haven't met him before, but uh, the you know I've uh, I I really enjoyed reading that, and and I think I wish I had something like that, and I don't know whether I would have fallen into the same stumbling block of oh well you know I don't really know enough to judge whether this is good or not because where it's not a YouTube video and it's a book, yeah, it feels a bit more official and a bit more yeah okay, but but it's is- also a different way of absorbing information, like it's a different way because. I love I love a video to watch, but sometimes having it in a book, step by step, or showing the way that things are in the book, I I think again people learn things in different ways, as we all know. But like I think that it, it that way of presenting it is you can take it piecemeal, and it, you it's, it's almost like being able to pause the video and then get the yeah. Picture, I, I, mean? I do like, also think there's something to be said about the fact that a book is obviously um, months and months of work put into a single entity to make sure it's perfect and the youtube video might be you know someone's got to get a video out this week yeah it might not be at, do you know what i mean like yeah. it, 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 no it might not be as um as kind of tightly put together and and quality controlled and things yeah. like that so the, i i would recommend that book uh, i don't know if you can readily get it i don't know if it was a short run or what but i'd recommend that book definitely and i think that made me realize how important the fundamentals are actually is that we've got this like really accomplished painter doing a book about painting techniques and spending a lot of time writing about the fundamentals. Yeah. Um, it does kind of make you like realize, oh, okay, I need to worry about removing a mold line just as much as I need to worry about doing perfect glazing on that NMM sword. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Books are nice as well because they force you to sit and stop and read and think. Whereas YouTube video is like next video or yeah. play. What's, what's next? What's next? What's also, next? Also, yeah. put them on your coffee table. People think you're cultured. <laughs> um, I've got a big stack of books. Um, it's all. It's literally like one Wes Anderson book, and then all minutes. Whenever, books. whenever, just virtue that, signaling yeah, that you're yeah, an expert yeah. to all of your friends. I, I literally, literally thought of that bit from Anchorman where he says, I, "I've got fine bound books or whatever it is." I think it's in Anchorman. I'm sure it is. Someone will correct me. But oh, there's another, there's yeah. another spot on quote. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah. Thought, I have I, other books, by the way. I'm just talking about like coffee, <laughs> coffee table books, like yeah. like big like yeah things yeah. of art in them and stuff like that. Yeah. But Karen, my point though, it's like it's something that I've drilled on about before on the podcast is there's no replacement for like practicing stuff. Yeah. And if you watch a video on a technique and you do it, and even if you do it well, it's not like, okay, box ticked, done. I just know how to do that now. Like there's no replacement for the hours Mm -hmm. and the repetition and the practice. It's like learning an instrument. It's like you don't pick up guitar play a D chord once perfectly and go, that's it. Give Got it. A, it. Give it's it, in there. Give it it's a twang in. and you can play whatever. But yeah, Do you think potentially um, then, like like I say, books might be, I don't know, it's difficult, I suppose, but I was going to say like, it might be more beneficial in that way because you're more inclined to just receive the information, put it down, put it away. Yes and, and then no. go off and do something. Whereas like potentially with videos, like video tutorials, you're you're locked in for yeah, half hour now. Do you know what I mean? Or, There's or something whatever. to be said though for like literally watching a video of someone doing something. That's true. That is and there's true, so yeah. much nuance to it. Like it's it's the draw an owl thing again. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, and how many photos are you going to show of something? And like, I still can't see the physical motion of you moving a brush. True. So yeah. there is a lot of value in that I will, as well. I will say just to go back to that book, he's done very well on some of those things. I think. Yeah. In terms yeah. of what pictures to include and stuff, that was another thing that was noticeably like yeah, yeah. impressive to me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure he has, but like, there's been plenty of videos that I've seen where 
even not the thing that they're talking about in the voiceover. Mm -hmm. I've noticed something that they've done. Yeah, I don't even yeah. think they notice that they do it. Yeah. But you just pick up on it, for example. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, even okay. though, like for example, like a, a very minor thing, and I know people have spoken about it, but like I've been watching a video of someone very, very early on and they just uh, rubbed off some of the moisture of the brush onto their thumb before they started putting it on the model. And they didn't even mention it. I was like, oh, what was that about? Yeah. And then like, I worked out from watching other videos and so on that the reason they were doing that was to remove like the excess moisture so you don't get yeah, no yeah. paint gobbing on your model. But yeah, I get the little mean. nuances like are very, very hard yeah. to pick up on. Yeah. Another thing that I wanted to to just say is that like, I think everyone's fundamentals are different based on the, the style of painting you want to do and also the purpose of what you're painting. I think that the, you almost have like, think of it like a shed with a load of tools in it. It's the best way for me to explain it. Some people will go in that shed and they're tasked to do a certain job or they want to do a certain thing and they'll pick a certain tool and other people will go in there and have a different thing they want to do and they'll pick a different tool, but they might include something that the other person would include and use it in a totally different way. And I think that's probably the best way for me to explain when it comes to, to miniature painting in general is that the, everyone has a different approach to the execution they want to carry out. And also on top of that, there's the layer of the purpose of that thing. And I think that sometimes, like you mentioned earlier in the conversation about like dry brushing, like even on stuff that I do, whether I'm doing it uh, for a higher level, if I'm going to enter into competition or whether I'm going to, you know, just paint something to the best ability, I'll still maybe do a little bit of dry brushing on some of the basic material. That doesn't mean that that fundamental technique is not suitable for my project because it's a high level project. Does that make sense? I guess no, it's then? kind of getting into the nuance of what's the difference between a fundamental and like a basic. Yeah. But I, I purposefully chose fundamental because that does change from person to person. Exactly. But I think people get put off by basics and think like, oh, I don't want to go back to basics because you sort of think you're beyond that. But I don't think that the basics are something you should ever stop practicing regardless of your skill mm -hmm. level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. If you enjoy listening to these podcast episodes every single week, I'd like to ask that you could please do us one small, tiny favor in return and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your podcast app. It takes only two seconds and it really, really helps us out and it allows us to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the episode. What are some of the most common things you see of people getting ahead of themselves? So I'd say, what are some of the basic techniques that you think people sometimes maybe fall a bit short of, like the commonalities amongst beginners? So for me personally, I would say the opacity of a base coat. Yeah. I often see people struggle with not thinning paints or like false application, but you know, some paints take like that fifth or sixth layer is when it really starts to cover properly. You know, when it's like 90% covered, but you just see a couple of little areas, like little things like that, for example. I think that is one really crucial and essential thing, like being able to base coat smoothly, solidly opaque with any paint. And this is where we add in the layer of every paint has a different personality. You should learn it. You should master all those different personalities and learn how they behave, how they dilute, how they dry, how they finish, all those kind of things. I think jumping ahead and trying to do like climb the mountain quicker than you than you should, like seeing things at the top of the mountain, like non-metallic metal, you know, and or you know, like uh, all these different things that are out there that that kind of you get a bit starry-eyed about. I think those things do detract massively from the core thing which we're speaking about, which is just which is base coating, like being able to put in that foundational level of paint, which everything else goes on top of in a smooth way without getting out the airbrush and doing it because you can't do it with a brush. Like there's, it's never, there's never a right or wrong option, whether to use, whether to use like a, a tool for a project. But what I would say is that you sh in my personal opinion, you should be able to do, get the same smooth base cut on something with a brush as you can uh, an airbrush, if that makes sense. Yeah. Where that does have a nuance is that would I brush paint a tank? Probably not, you know, for various reasons, just because of like, because of time. And also because factually I can get the same quality with an airbrush 10 times quicker. So why wouldn't, why would I not use that over a paintbrush? But even with that being said, let's just say we airbrushed a tank, a solid color, but then maybe one of the, the weapon gun shields or something, you wanted it in a different color. I'm not going to, if I've, if I've packed my airbrush away or if I've taken it apart or whatever, blah, blah, blah I don't want to change the color or something like that having the option in your skill set and your ability to get that color paint you want the gun shield and do it with a brush and get it to the same opacity through repetition and through practice and knowledge of that paint and the way to, that it behaves that's something that you shouldn't sacrifice as a painter for trying to climb the mountain quicker and get to a, get 
try these other things that you've heard the terms and heard the things without mastering the fundamentals. I think that's one of the most important things. I do think as well, especially with this one, the base coat thing, I think more often than not, rather than being they don't have the knowledge or ability, it's more that they're rushing. Yeah. Yeah. Like we've all been there. Like, especially with certain paints, like you say, sometimes it pushes to a fifth or sixth coat. I think sometimes it's that people are thinking, well, I can't possibly need a fifth coat. Like I never see anyone talk about doing five, six, seven coats. Yeah. And then you start thinking, oh, I must be doing it wrong. I must be doing it wrong. So it should be, I guess it's fine as it is. Yeah. But like you get to that or simply people are just really trying to rush on the model. They're sick of base coating. They don't enjoy base coating. I don't enjoy base coating. Hate it. It's boring. <laughs> so I get it. And I find myself often like being like, okay, that's probably done. And then I'll like look over the model. Or I'll move on to the next stage and I'll see a bit and I'll be like, oh, I didn't. I just, I've pushed past it too quick. You know what I mean? Like, Cause I was bored. Yeah. Um, so I do, I, I do think, I don't know how many other situations that's going to um, be relevant for, but I think specifically with a base coating one, often it is that people are just rushing. Yeah. Like I think, address the problem like then and there when you notice it. It's a similar thing to what we're saying when people over thin paints. Yeah. We're like, if you notice that, don't just like leave it, leave it and go ahead with it. Yeah. It's annoying. It's going to, you know, pause you for a few minutes, whatever. It's really annoying, but you got to fix it now. Same with like, if you know, deep down, you haven't done enough, you haven't covered it properly. Like just fix it then. Yeah. Don't leave it. Do you know what I mean? It will, you will, you will, it will, it will show up. Yeah. Are there any like as experienced painters? Are there any thank you? Fundam- <laughs> are there any fundamental things that you've noticed that you occasionally struggle with? And I'll leave with an example. It, it reminded me of what you said about the rushing thing. I have had to force myself to stop doing this thing where, say, for example, I'm base coating like some trim on a Space Marine, and I'm doing it a different color than the inner side of the, the inner part of the shoulder pad, and say I'm blocking that in with the base coat and I accidentally get a bit of paint on an area that I'm not supposed to. It's the wrong color. The panic, try to get it off and make things look way worse where I've tried to learn that letting stuff dry, even though it seems like that would be the the wrong thing to do is often much, much easier to fix because drying paint tends to turn like crumble mm. and leave texture on things. So when I'm blocking stuff in, I've had to start like, like you said, like not rushing and being like, oh, made a mistake, quick, 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 like get rinse the brush, sort it out, which like sometimes does work, but just that spirit of like rushing constantly working with drying paint, like it's not always the right approach. That makes mm. sense. Is there anything you struggle with? Yeah. Like for me, I've said this before, like cloth is something that I've always, always, it's only it's only really this year that I put a lot of effort into trying to make cloth better because, and that's talking about like leathers and fabrics and all those kind of things. Like it's something that I really did painting eight foot tall ceramite covered space marines for a long time and not being a dark angels painter. <laughs> I, I, I don't really paint much cloth and it's something that I really, really um, neglected in my painting, I think uh, for a long time. So you could say, you could just make an argument. Sorry, just go back on that point. You can make an argument that being a Dark Angels fan would have benefited your painting. Is I that knew what he was going to angle it in some way. <laughs> so it would have benefited your painting. And, and if, if, for example, we were having a conversation about should someone do a Dark Angels army or should they do a Black Angels army, <laughs> that might have been an argument that could have been put forward for reason to do Dark Angels because it would have I mean if you want to dig, if you dig, dig up that coffin again then sure thing I'm just <laughs> but, saying that. I'm yeah, just saying but, I'm just you know yeah but I think that's something that I I'm, I've really neglected as like a finished result but the thing is is that the techniques that are involved with rendering it and doing it and creating it the way I want it to look or the way that I feel it should look or the way that when someone looks at it they interpret it as material um I can do those technical things but for other things like glazing on armor or like uh you know or on swords or whatever the case may be but i think i just didn't apply enough time with the fundamental technique trying to make that item look as realistic as possible i always used to find that my leather on stuff was really like didn't look like leather and i'd be i'd go why doesn't it look like leather and then it, it was only through 
looking at real leather and then trying to paint what I saw on the model way more refined and just match that, that I yeah. kind of started to get it to look as real as I hope that I make it Do look. Do you think that you was maybe getting distracted with like the full picture of it rather than breaking it down into yeah. the, the actual stages of putting paint on it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. If you get what I mean, like the, okay, base coat, then we're going to layer it because that's going to do this yeah. and then we're going to do a second stage. Is that potentially a fundamental in itself, like realising that there's no set process or way to paint every single surface? Like there Correct, is, yeah. you you can paint a full model and not every section is going to be one base coat, one shade, yeah. two highlights, that's it. Yeah. Like if you want it to look like different um, materials, yeah, yeah. I think potentially that is a fundamental in itself is acknowledging that you're going to have to do different things for different materials and stuff like that. I think ultimately because the miniature is just bare plastic, everything that you do to it as a painter is what makes someone who's reading it interpret the, the, the things that you painted on there as the physical material object thing that they are. Do you know what? I'll be honest as well. You were the first person who ever said anything like that to me i'd never even thought about that before like mm. when when i started working here you were talking about like <laughs> i think i asked you something like oh like it might have literally been leather you know Could have been, and yeah. you've just used leather as an example because i remember i was painting um it was either leather or cloth or something because i was painting the blackstone fortress stuff that i've mentioned before at the time when i started working it and i think you literally just said like well have you looked at pictures of leather and I was like, no, <laughs> no, think, I'm, I'm base coated it and I'm shaded it and I've done two highlights. Like, yeah. Why doesn't it look like leather? It's brown. Yeah. And then it was like, well, have you looked at pictures of leather? And I looked at pictures of like leather belts or something. I was like, yeah, it doesn't look anything like what I've painted. Yeah. Well, I, th really I think, different. I think that's one of the things like, I'll, 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 like ultimately with, with any painting, even, even back like with, with famous painters that have painted like canvases or whatever, like it's deception. That's what, that's what, that's what painting is. You are manifesting and creating something to deceive the viewer, to read it as the thing that you want them to read it as. Does that make sense? So I think when you really break it down and you, to that core objective, it actually makes doing it on the model more approachable because rather than thinking, Oh, I've got to paint this brown and make it look like leather. You flip it the other way and go, that's what leather looks like. I need to make that look like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I think rather than as well, how those fundamental techniques translate to other materials. Yeah. So for example, I, for the longest time, was painting every single surface as if it was space marine ceramite. This is, that's what I'm everything saying. Everything yeah. is going to be <laughs> base coat and then wash and then one highlight stage and then another highlight stage within it, which looks, for example, on cloth, mental. Because yeah. cloth is a smooth flowing material. Yeah. So that would, when I would, that would be where I'd start incorporating things like wet blending, for example, or glazing where I might not necessarily do that on a hard armored surface. There's still, and if I was to do those techniques on a hard armored surface, even though the, the fundamental technique is the same, it's, the application would be very, very different in the way that I would approach it. As artists, we know how time consuming painting miniatures is, especially if you want to achieve a high standard for tabletop or display. Life is busy and we don't all have eight hours a day to paint. Plus, if you're still early in your painting journey, it may feel that you're a long way off ever owning your own beautiful army for your games. For 10 years, Siege Studios has been delivering bespoke miniature painting commissions to collectors and gamers all over the world. We have a world-class team of artists from Golden Demon winners to ex-studio painters, collating hundreds of years of collective experience. Here at Siege, we offer a series of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a favorite character for your display or a stunning gaming army. We pride ourselves on offering well above the industry standard of quality and our customer experience. To see our gallery, learn more about our services and get a quote now, head over to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. I think I've mentioned before that one of the things I struggled the most with is looking at the heavy metal style mm -hmm. and looking at the more realistic style mm -hmm. um, and deciding, number one, what, what, what way do I want to go? But specifically, I think with the more realistic thing, although there's a lot more, it depends really, but I would say if you were going to do a more realistic looking model um, to a high level, there's generally more higher level um, techniques in there. So you're glazing a lot more, you're understanding volumes a lot more, you may be stippling on like cloth and things like that. A lot more texture being put on by the brush. But I think 
I, I find that easier to understand, like going in, like, oh, that is literally that leather belt needs to look like a real leather belt. Yeah. I think the problem that I had was doing the every metal box art style, taking a real thing and going, okay, it still needs to look like the real thing, but it also is going through this heavy metal filter. Yeah, I do, do you know what, what I mean? mean. Yeah. So you're almost leather like, looks like leather, but it also looks nothing like you're, leather. <laughs> you're you're almost like because that's another thing I wanted to point out is that like looking at oh there's a picture of leather and then putting it on your heavy metal style marine, you still need to put it through the heavy metal filter. There's yeah. something magic I mean? about like, that though because like you look at it and you go oh that looks like leather, but then if you look at a photo of leather and a photo of a space marine belt, they're not at all aligned. Yeah, that, this is what I'm saying. I think, I oh, think yeah, you should yeah, pull, that, pull stuff from the real image, 100%. If you're doing, this is if you're doing an heavy metal style model. Yeah. Pull stuff from the, the real image. But um, it's like the, the armor, the ceramite that you're talking about, that sets the precedent for what an heavy metal version of a big flat surface looks like. So you've got that knowledge already. So then you need to put your that filter on the other stuff. Yeah. Like, what would a belt look like going through that same filter kind of thing? Or what would a cloth look like going through that same filter? It's not going to be super realistic. So I think it can be a bit jarring looking at an every metal style model that has a super realistic cloth yeah. robe on it or yeah. a super realistic. That's why and I don't want to open up the NMM conversation <laughs> again, but I think sometimes metallics and NMM and stuff like that can look a little bit out of place potentially, unless it's trying to, showcase something like magical like on the doing the blending on a power yeah. sword and things like that if the rest of the model doesn't have it if you've just got a single wear we've spoke many times you've got about to fully commit if you're gonna yeah. uh, you've got to fully commit to it like if that's, that's we've spoke that many was... times about oh mixing and matching true metallics and nmm and it looks a bit odd or whatever so that's kind of what i'm getting at is it's all going through this filter um and getting that right can be really difficult luckily there's tons of heavy metal examples out there so you can look at how they've put it through that filter they're setting the precedent aren't yeah they? yeah that's the point i was trying to make earlier about how if you tried to do literally every single technique you can think of on one model it would look insane yeah yeah <laughs> because they don't there's no parity with the style yeah yeah that's yeah. the next challenge <laughs> yeah every single every single uh technique known to man on a single space, space brain yeah. yeah there you go Question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please leave it in the comments down below on YouTube. Or if you are listening on your favorite podcasting app, then please leave us a direct message on Instagram at Siege Studios. This week, we have a question from The Serpent Scribe who says, Hey lads, my favorite part of the hobby is converting. I love making miniatures unique to my army. I have an army of heavily converted Space Marines, and I love how they came out. However, beyond a spray base coat, they haven't seen a drop of paint because I'm worried about ruining the hard work I've already done. I feel like they always look better in my head than I can paint them, but fully converting another mini or several to practice seems a bit excessive. I know with Siege, you sometimes do custom sculpting or conversions. How do you get past that fear of ruining the hard work? This is a really good question. Mm -hmm. So George has some experience painting some of the custom service models. So you can probably share some. Yeah, quite recently. Some things on so that. Yeah. Um, but I have like a similar thing where, so a while ago from when we were setting up like the custom service stuff, um, uh, you obviously got me the Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was no way in hell that I wanted to, even attempt to paint that. So we got one of the team to paint it for me instead. But the in, among that also, um, Ben, who was like one of the first sculptors that we spoke to about joining the team, it's a fellow Dark Angel enjoyer. Had to chuck it in. Um, and well, it's relevant to the point, in fairness. Um, he had a couple of, he sculpted the Ezekiel as well. So he did, it's, yes. It's very relevant. Thank you. I only mention it if it's relevant. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the, he had a couple of extra ones knocking around that he'd done and he maybe had done different versions for himself since. And it's a, a Terminator chaplain and yeah. a Terminator librarian. And um, you got them off him and gifted them to me, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. um, one of them has been primed and I have not touched them since because I am terrified to paint them and ruin them. Uh, so I completely understand 
I'll put a picture up now. You'll see one of them is primed <laughs> and one of them has not been touched uh, for that exact reason. Um, we obviously lightly touched on recently that I'm starting a Space Marine Army. So I did toy with the idea of now painting these to include them. They're slightly outscaled now with the new Terminators, but I, I love the models so much that I, I do want to work them into the army somehow. There's some Dark Angels heraldry on them that I can kind of maybe get around or something. But um, Or I'll paint them as one-off Dark Angel models because I do really like them. But um, I'd be interested to hear your answer on this as well because I am very scared to touch these well, models. I have the perfect answer for you, Joe, okay. because it's based on something that you have said yourself before. So oh, I'm going to throw a bit of your own logic back no, at you. No, not my own words coming back. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I don't like that. Caveat, I'm going to say this in a very opinionated way because I'm very passionate about this topic. So everyone has their own thoughts. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Trust the process. Oh, I knew that would come back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> but take your damn time. Everyone is so obsessed with speed painting everything and it drives me mad because when there's like something people like, they're like, I know people that will spend like 100 hours converting a model and they'll paint it in an afternoon. And fair enough if you just enjoy the converting and you're not bothered about the result. But if you're going to be bothered about the result, but you're also not willing to put the effort in, like the blame is on you. Do you know what I mean? If you trust the process and you set a plan and you do it based on past experiences, I understand the fear of like not wanting to mess it up, but recognizing that you can strip the model. And if you're painting while taking your time and you're doing nice thin coats, you can just paint over it if you make a mistake. So taking your time and trusting the process and knowing that it's not going to look great until the end, but you can keep going. Like this is why I love competition painting because it's never like really finished. You can take something you spent 300 hours on, but you can still pick it up and go like, ah, I still do a little bit more. Like, and I understand that getting into that mindset can be difficult if you've not done that before, but trusting the process and taking your time and putting the paint on smoothly and just chipping away at that, like working to get there and not saying, oh, I've got three days to paint this. I need to paint it the best that I possibly can. It's got to be done. And if I haven't got a whip to show on Instagram by next week, then my 15 followers are going to judge me. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it's so one, once you've done one as well and you've done a couple of them and you have trusted that process and you've seen the result, it gives you the confidence on the next one to go, okay, I remember this model looking terrible at one point in time and it didn't in the end. So I know that in my head, I'm going to just discredit those like dark thoughts and just keep going at it. Yeah. Yeah. What about because you? I'm gonna. The reason I went straight to George Day is because you've done more. You've done a couple of them like directly for clients. I think James, you did a lot of the promotional ones. Yeah. So I, I initially I was thinking that might be less pressure, but actually it's 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 the promotional models. Yeah. So it's like just as just as important kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I mean, I kind of doubled up on that one because number one, it was you did two of them. I did for when we for the launch for the launch of custom service. I done Carandrus and obviously Dante. Um. Yeah, so I kind of doubled up because mm. number one, it was a promotional model for us launching custom service, and it is arguably my favourite character ever. So you in a model, the, the in a most model, pressure in a possible. model, in a model, which, <laughs> in a one-off model, in a one-off model, which I absolutely wanted. Like you know, from the moment I sort of it was um, your you yeah. you designed that was kind of how yeah. we worked. It was like you you designed that one. I chose like the Ezekiel one. Yeah, and we kind of went together on a couple of the others. Yeah, it it, it like so. I agree and synergize with George a little bit in the sense of the planning is is really important. Um, purely because like I so I printed off pictures like Carandrus example. I picked, printed off pictures of Carandrus looking in certain colors and certain ways that I wanted to put onto the model. And like so I've done a lot of research into how I wanted the model to look to start off with Paul. That I like the way that the the chainsaw looks in this one, or I like the way that this looks in this one, or I love the way that the, the, the glow effect looks here and all this kind of different stuff. Like I pulled all of that. And then obviously planning, the planning side of it is choosing your colors, choosing, you know, there's maybe there's certain things on the model tying back to material. Maybe there's certain colors that base coat a bit smoother and things like that. Like all those strategic options that you choose are like really important. All of that led me to then work on those models in a very pressurized time and also, uh, uh, emotional investment because Dante was an extremely emotional investment for me because it's more, it's, it's a one of one model for me that I had made in the way I wanted Dante to look. Plus also it's the launch model. So it was a, it was a lot on just on, on that one model. Carandrus, I was a bit actually more relaxed on because my favorite Phoenix Lord, but I wasn't as emotionally invested into it as I was Dante, for example. Oh, yeah. Naturally yeah. Like 
that yeah i've got one other thing to throw in the mix which is one that was made for me that i wasn't aware about until a couple of years ago it was a birthday present so ah so re got me and i'll stick up a photo there you go it'll be there now we'll stick up a photo of it um but it is the death company chaplain off the front of the second edition blood angels or angels of death codex um i had no idea about it at all whatsoever um and i think that was got for my re got me that for my 36th 35th 36th birthday i think it was it was two years ago yeah i'm trying to think because i i i kind of worked with re on this like it was literally like we were all working in the same office room at the time and it was like every time james left she'd be like sneaking me a little like <laughs> picture i don't even think we were on like slack yet so we no, didn't have well. like internal messaging so we couldn't be sitting there like messaging each other like next to each other it was like literally like every time james left the room it'd be like a little note passed to me or like or like <laughs> yeah. we would talk about like really briefly or something quickly trying to decide it and it was like i still have a video somewhere of james receiving the model because the idea was we were going to give we gave it to him as a surprise um, obviously, it was Ree's present to James. And Ben. Um, ben here. delivered it. Ben, who sculpted it, delivered oh, right. it. He yeah, just he turned up office. at the office without James knowing. I, was, I remember opening the door. I was like, what the hell are you doing? He was instantly <laughs> like defensive and everything. But it's so funny watching the video back. I f for some reason, I found it not too long ago. I still have it somewhere. But the idea was that, um, you know, James would paint it over the next few months. And then we'd put some little social video um, together. Obviously, that never happened. It hasn't been painted. Um, yeah. For the reasons that he's explained there. But it's funny watching the video now because like, if we put that video, if, if you eventually paint that. I am going to. And that's what I was going to And we about. put that video together. Like, number one, the team in the video is like a little bit different. There's like people in the office who are in that video that don't work here anymore and stuff like that. The whole office looks different. Like it looks so outdated already. Yeah. It's, um, it, was, it, it was about two years ago, but I am. I think so, it was longer, you know. It may well be, yeah. I think it was longer. Maybe three. Potentially. Potentially. It might have been three years yeah, ago. It might be three years ago. I think you already had custom service when I joined the company and that was three years ago. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, it was around, it was almost the first model that we did outside of the launch models. Yeah. So it was like we done custom much, service about, launched and then I remember... Re was working on this pretty quickly, or maybe even maybe the year after. I don't know. I, yeah, well, I, 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 I'll look at the date of the video and we'll work it out. But it, it, yeah, that's a good point. I forgot. So about I, that I am. Completely. I am gonna. I am gonna paint it. But this is where this one's even more difficult for me because it, that book for me is like why I fell in love with Blood Angels and like uh, and so the cover model of that book and having a model that is a a direct extrapolation of the artwork in 3d form plus also wanting to paint it like the book in an ever metal style so the problem with that is it's got it's full of non-metallics now I'll, anyone who knows me well enough knows that i am even though blending is something which i i spent a lot of time practicing and getting to a point that i'm happy with doing non-metallic metals is, is my everest it's my it's my thing that i'm a bit like a bit uh, a bit um so that like the, the technical blending side of it i i I'm confident I'll be able to do smooth blending between all the colors and stuff, but it's the volumetric it's more stuff. more like correctly understanding the volumes. Yeah. yeah, which is the scary thing for me. So uh, approaching it and and it's ultimately like, you know, doing doing the model justice to where, because uh, obviously that when someone sees it, once it's fully painted, I want it to be, for anyone who knows that book and knows that artwork and knows that, that, that what it should look like, I want it to be, it's, it's almost that thing we're saying, you know, making that thing that is just plastic, or in this case, green stuff and sculpting materials and, and plastic, making that read visually as the thing that people know what it's going to look like. So just to get onto the, the question, you know, which I think we've all been talking about in a loose way, but I really want to hit on answer the question. I think one of the things to, to, to say is definitely have a plan in place of how you want to do it taking some of the things that George has said as well is like, don't feel that you have to rush it. If you just want to work on the metallics and just work on those details and get them as painted as best support, if you want to work on the armor or maybe a red little detail here or, or this color detail here, whatever, don't feel that you need to do it like super rapid. Cause I think you're quite right in what George said like about like people want to just get that instant win, that dopamine, instant gratification for getting something done. If you put I don't so think it's just that. I think it's just people that's the way people approach other stuff. So they just extrapolate it and yeah, put it I onto think that. So, yeah. I, I do think, think so. that is part of it though. I do yeah. agree. Like, I do yeah. agree. Like, it's like I was saying like I'd rather it's like 
in, my instant like um, intuition is to potentially skip the last base coat layer if it means that I get to say, yeah, it's done and I feel good about it being yeah. done. Like it yeah. does happen. Yeah. yeah. I, I think one of the other things to say as well is that like if you spent all this time doing conversion and making the models really unique and how you want them to look, it does put that kind of like, from like I, I did have with Dante or like with this this Death Company chaplain, like it puts that fear in you of of, of making that mistake. I com think people have the same fear as well. Like, I don't think it's necessarily specific to conversion either. Like, people often echo this exact same sentiment and fear of a more expensive model. I was going to say, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it right, could be yeah. like, oh, I'm, but I had it with Multarium and I had Multarium originally. I was like, this is the most expensive model I've ever bought. I do not want to ruin it. So yeah. I'm not going to paint it. Yeah. yeah. Like, that was literally it. Like, <laughs> the, the thing is, it's like confidence is just experience. That's all it is, being on, honest with you. And I always try and bring it right down to to a, to that level because that's what it is like touching upon the music side for like that we all experience in the first time i got on stage and played in front of an audience i was petrified the 25th time i went on stage or the 50th or the 100th or 200th like, i wasn't petrified because that repetition of doing it so it becomes normal it becomes normal but so if you're someone who's painted a lot of models before and then you're having this fear about like the one you've converted or the expensive character whatever that fear is entirely emotional. It's not actually an objective truth. You've got if, factual reasons as to look at your other models and go like, I know that it's going to be fine because I can look at all those models. But yeah, equally, yeah. like it is the same thing. Like despite you having all of this like past tense, you've put all this emotional investment into it. By just looking at it in an objective fact of this is a model in front of you, just like any other, you are going to approach it and paint it in the exact same way. Mm. Or maybe, you know, you don't feel like your painting level is where you want it to be. So, oh, I've got to paint like a thousand more models and then get better at painting before I paint this. But that's not to say that you couldn't learn how to do all of those things on this no, model exactly. yeah. or repaint it or touch up your mistakes. Because like I said, if you're taking your time and you're being neat and you're being careful, there's no mistake you can't overcome with it. No, exactly. Yeah. I, I think it, it, like in summary, like one, one of the things I'd recommend you do is, is get a model which has a lot of the aspects of detail readability what i mean it's got metallics or bionics or leather or pouches or you know, flesh or whatever i think get a model that has the closest percentage of those things that are relative to the marines that you've converted and paint that as a test model to get to the experience which will translate into confidence so that when you approach the secondary one model or the next model or the next model that maybe is one of the converted models. I'm going to contradict done. myself here because I said a couple of weeks ago about how I'm a big fan of test models. I completely disagree with what you've just said. I think that that's a procrastination project and that's just you kicking the can even further down the road. I think you need to just go for it because I don't think you get over that fear I understand, by any yeah. other way than just jumping in the deep end and just doing I it. Mm. I think it's a little bit different in this case for this commenter purely because like there's that emotional connection to actually making the model. And it, the, and, it depends and the, and as well. We don't know the level of painting experience. Yeah, there or, is that. That's like fair. That. So it's like, yeah. if it is literally a case of having not painted that many models at all, then I would agree with you hundred percent. I dive, I dive straight in and get on with it. How like uh, when I painted Dante, I got some sanguinary guard torsos and legs. Yeah. And I tested the way that I wanted the metallics on it because I didn't want to put golds, knowing what metallic paints can be like and choosing the right metallics to get it in the way that I wanted. I didn't want to put that gold on, on him until I knew my recipe and the way that I was doing it. But and I don't think there's any harm with the practice, but I'm saying why not just practice it on the actual model that you want to get finished. Cause then you'll some, benefit. From because it. if you, like I said, if you make a mistake, no, I do paint over that. it or strip it or do whatever you've got to do to work around it. But I think you should just be refining the actual model you want rather than trying to get this other model that's a third party and completely irrelevant. And it's not going to be the same because you haven't got any I've emotional got, investment I, in that model. Oh, no, so I, the feeling I, isn't going to be the same I, when you're I, doing I've it. I've got a, a bit of a middle ground potentially. So the commenter did say, they say, did they mention specifically how much they enjoy doing the converting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So convert yourself up a model that could fit into the army if you wanted it to. Yeah. But maybe take away some of the pressure of it being like, this is part of the army 100%. Like, yeah. I love this model so much. Maybe just do it as a bit of a... Painting exercise. Yeah, and and... You enjoy doing the converting anyway. At the end of it, if you get a model that you're happy with and you can stick it in the army, then great. But it, it gives you an opportunity to do the test run without some of the pressure. But yeah. I think, do you get where I'm coming from? Though? I get the, where the you're coming from. The pressure is the like, problem, not actually the painting. Yeah, because but, if you take a model where you've got none of that pressure on you, I don't think those skills are, well, you can extrapolate those but, onto the one that you have got the pressure here's for. Here's the, here's the difference is, one of the things we mentioned earlier was that if you've already painted a load of models and they are to a, 
a quality that you're happy with, then you have this stuff where you, you, you have proof that it's entirely emotional because you've got factual evidence that you can paint really well. Mm. Yeah. But they, we don't have all the info and they did also mention that they've not painted any of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the fact that they haven't painted any of them, I would suggest do one that you care a little bit less about, paint it. Then almost just to prove to yourself like this is fine. And then I would say go, go all in. The, the, the other thing I was just going to add on is like with, you mentioned stripping specifically, if it's a plastic model, then hundred percent, you can easily strip the model using bio strip or, you know, if you're in the States, you can use simply green or other, other things like that. However, um, with what I was working on stripping green stuff, yeah, it's it, a different it, has, it has a completely different, it can ruin the model. And that's, that's, I think it's one of the things. I think or, you'll agree though, that if you do paint your model neatly with nice, you thin can just base go coats, Oh you no, can I agree just, with you. I you do agree. Yeah, even, even just spraying over yeah. it. I do yeah. agree. Yeah. What, what, what I would say is that like for, for the comments of like what you're experiencing as, a, as an emotion is perfectly normal. Like, uh, oh, it's completely you know, valid. Because, uh, yeah. It's completely normal, and completely valid. Like all of us, at all our different stages of our painting journey have that feeling, you know, whether it's a super expensive model, whether it's one you're super emotionally invested into, whether it's one that, you know, you, you've got to do it justice in the paint job and you don't, you, and it's, a, and you're not, it's really difficult to get another one of that model or it's a rare old model or any, any kind of that stuff like that. It's a perfectly normal thing. And I think whichever method you choose to to cross that bridge, you know, I think that you just need to do it because that will give you the experience of an experience which directly translates into confidence. And that's one of the most important things. Okay. Our little closing tradition on the show is a segment that we call Hobby Hacks. This is where we share a little quick tip with you that you can hopefully implement into your painting, perhaps while you're even listening to the show. James, you have a hobby hack for us this week? Yeah. So we mentioned uh, in the conversation in this episode about making slips or mistakes or things like that. And you're quite right. Leaving it to dry on the model sometimes can, if you, as long as it's smooth, you can cover it quite easily. Um, however, we've all been there before where we've made a mistake and it's a big slip and you get that paint off as quickly as possible because you don't want to stain the model with that color or it's quite thick or whatever the case may be. Or you try to get it off and you make it worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Part of my painting process uh, for most of my miniatures, be it army, competition, et cetera, is to, once I get the majority color on the model and typically like errors or mistakes or things like that, if they do happen, I'd, I'd say probably most people find it tends to be during the blocking in process because you're, you're putting on quite a large volume of paint onto a myriad of different surfaces and materials, et cetera. Um, I gloss varnish the model. Uh, just with the airbrush. I do a 50-50 thinner and gloss varnish once I put the main color on. So I'll pick my, my poster boys. I'll, if I paint them all blood red or, or whatever color you do as an armor color, I'll then gloss varnish it typically. What that does is it gives me a really good protective layer. Think of it like a save point in the computer game. If you played a computer game for like 15 hours and there was a power cut, you'd be pretty annoyed if you didn't save it. I love yeah? that it says computer game. I love that it's computer game. I love that it's save point. Yeah. Like as if things haven't been auto saving for 15 <laughs> years. Like it's that, a good analogy. It's though. very endearing. It. That's, it. that's, <laughs> that's how you know I'm of a certain vintage yeah. or OG. So there you go. He's um, like, think of it this way. You, your mum accidentally unplugs your GameCube. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the GameCube. Yeah. Someone's on the phone. The dial-up goes down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not that old. Okay. Oh, I had that. You're definitely <laughs> that old. Yeah. Well, you should be. You should be insulted a little bit. Yeah. yeah. You're um, halfway through transferring your floppy disk over. The power goes I out. I remember, We've all been there. I remember floppy disks. George okay. is just uh, pulling up stuff he's like read about. Yeah, he it's been actually... to the museum. You yeah, see yeah. The museum. Yeah, yeah. You got one of those phones where you push a number and you spin it round. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, the reason a gloss varnish is really good um, is so that it puts that protective layer over the base coat. But obviously uh, for things like pin shading, obviously doing transfers to Microsoft, Microset, like those protect that it puts that protective layer over the paint job that you put on where you can do other things on the surface. And obviously that paint running, running better in recesses or, you know, that it, it, it has a really, really good beneficial um, thing to it. The one thing that I also find as well is that if you do make a little mistake, you can get a damp brush or a wet brush and you can move the brush on the surface and it will, the paint will lift off. It doesn't want to stick it as well. It doesn't want to stick as well, yeah. which I think is quite helpful. But there's also something else and it's something that only recently on the class, like a couple of students said it to me and they were like, I actually find the way that the paint behaves on the gloss is a little bit different as in the way it flows on the surface. And that is because of that sheen that it does have. So Give that a try. Gloss varnish your models, 50-50 thinner and, and uh, gloss varnish through the airbrush. A nice consistent coat over the model and and try and paint on that. And if you do make a mistake, rather than maybe letting it dry, just literally 
get a wet or damp brush and just remove it as quickly as possible. Just had, to clarify, this is after the base coating stage where all your main colors yeah, are where in. Where your main, yeah, where all your main... No, so it can be either once the main color is on the model and you're going to base coat all the like pouches, metals, all that kind of stuff, can be at that point. Or when you have base coated everything... I, just to jump on that a little bit, I've kind of taken to getting the main color on mm -hmm. and then doing a satin varnish. Mm -hmm. Just because I like the idea of... I don't particularly like painting over gloss... I get what they're saying, but it does it feel does, a little bit different. It does yeah. also depend on the varnish you use because some are yeah. worse than others. And also this other thing of like, I actually, initially I started doing a gloss varnish stage at that point because you'd mentioned about how it helps with recess shading, which obviously does. Um, but I found that I actually then hated tidying up over the gloss because your point is that if you make a mistake, you can get rid of it. That's not what I was doing. But like, I was like, Rubbing stuff off. Uh, not even that. Like it was like if I'd done a slip and it was like, okay, I'll paint over that after or I'll tidy that up after or or whatever. Then like you can noticeably see your correction because your correction doesn't have the gloss varnish on it. I know there's a varnish going over it at the end anyway. Yeah. It's going to tie it all it's in. It's not the final like, varnish. It was yeah. just like annoying. You've got to like trust that it's going to Yeah, and it's like well. an extra thing to worry about. But what I have enjoyed is doing a satin thing so that, we, we've spoke before about every paint having different personalities and different finishes and stuff like that. So I like giving it this point of like, okay, everything has the same finish at yeah. the minute. Everything, everything looks satin kind of thing. Like that, that's <laughs> just, this is fine, and it's like a bit of a less, yeah, one less Harsh. thing to worry about. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. but I it mean, does also help with recess shading to a certain extent. If so, yeah, yeah. if a color is particularly matte, yeah, then it, then it gives it a bit of a sheen. I, I, I had an incident with a Katachan and uh, who looked like he'd went swimming in 950. It looked like the Harkonnen oh. leader in June where he comes out swimming <laughs> yeah. and he's got like, oh, it's got like oil all over him. Like, I was going to say about accident, look, accidentally dropping a model on your palette. Oh, yeah. I'd done that last night. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we've all been there. Yeah. We've all been there. That's... I grabbed a big brush. It, the the Katachan was gloss varnished so I could do the pin shading on the flesh and I'd done all my airbrush stages because I, I do all the airbrush skin, I paint the whole model pretty much skin for Mark Cashans. And then um, he literally fell off off the shirt. I think it was either a shirt. No, it was re sister dropped it in. Or it was either re or re sister dropped it. Blame another um, <laughs> But I had the production line going on. It was before at no I retreat. remember, yeah, I yeah, remember it. I one remember of, it well. Either re or a sister dropped it in that dropped it in the um in, in on the pallet or something and it landed he landed like head first into like he's literally his legs were sticking up off the pallet and his head was in like a like a puddle of nine five oh could have been worse. You could have dropped it in the fish bowl. <laughs> yeah. It would have been it would have been it's clean. It's not a fish bowl. Uh, I grabbed a brush with water. Could have and dropped it in the candle. <laughs> yeah, <it sounds> bad. <laughs> the candle bowl. The candle yeah. bowl. Oh, yeah. candle bowl, yeah. sorry. And I literally got a wet brush and just got loads of water and got all of this 950 off. And everyone who knows 950 knows how strong that paint is. Um, and I managed to get all of it off, but it, fortunately, because it had that gloss there, it protected it, and it, it did save save me massively as a result of that. Um, but yeah, give it a try. Um, it's great for transfers, great for pin shading, and, and just see obviously how, how it helps for you if you if you find it beneficial. So yeah. Cool. We'll leave it there. Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a number of ways, but mainly is our Patreon. Please check out the links in the description of this video or in the show notes on your podcast app and you'll find a link there. And in, notably, you can submit your models for our first episode of Critique Clinic, which will be coming up very, very soon. You'll find more details on there and the launch video as well. Thank you everyone. We will catch you next week. Bye.